Hey everyone, welcome to the Deciding Factor Podcast. I'm John. I'm Alton. And I'm Barbara. <laughs> oh, together we formulate this awesome show. Alton, describe it in a nutshell for us. Hmm, what do we do here? Well, if you like to think independently and you don't think of yourself as a sheep, you want to learn, you want to be challenged, you don't mind being offended every once in a while, then this is the show for you. We take complicated topics sometimes. Uh, sometimes they're a little bit more simple. But, uh, yeah, we try to cut them up, chop them up, argue about it, and then formulate our opinion and have our deciding factor where we just basically give you our opinion on why we feel the way we do. And that's at the end of the show. So you want to stick around for the whole thing. Yes. And so just to give you an idea, about a year ago, we had COVID that was going on. And they said that hydroxychloroquine was not the drug to be Ooh. used. Yeah, didn't exactly. we get banned or something? Yeah, I feel so like we got banned for that. For a while. We did a show of that yeah. seven months ago. We got uh, banned. We got yelled at. I had way too much harassment from it. <laughs> yes, kicked through the internet. <laughs> and today, as of this morning, Fox News reported that there is actually a study released that showed the uh, effects of hydroxychloroquine if you had a ventilator, your chances were improved 200%. So, you can... It's a good thing we're not the sort of people that are like, I told you, but I told you. <laughs> we're not? Because like I'm that. totally I don't think... that way. We're not like that. Okay, go ahead, Alton. I'm like, don't waste my do. advice, oh. man. <laughs> That's what we're here for. We're here to learn. And if you don't want to like listen to us, of what you be like, hey, I told you so. Yes. Should listen to more <laughs> of the deciding factor. <laughs> so make sure you stay tuned. Find us on social media as well as YouTube. Follow us on our own webpage, the deciding factor podcast.com, because you too can stay tuned to some crazy things that come your way. And also make sure you click subscribing that notification because we do go live and not only does it surprise you, but it surprises my co-host. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, guys, this show is, do you actually control your own pain and suffering? Barb, do you think they'll actually learn something? I, mm. <laughs> I, I think that it's there's a lot of good stories. Um, I yeah, yeah let's we'll stop. I don't want you to give away yes. anything anymore. Terry, Terry's an awesome guest for sure. You're not gonna. He is an awesome gonna, guest. You need to listen. It's worth it. Yes. Yeah. And if you didn't check out the Deciding Factor Extra with Terry, make sure you go back and check it out because we have a new phrase we will be using in the future, <laughs> and you've got to find out what that is, guys. This is the Deciding Factor Podcast. Everyday life issues broken down to help you build your own opinions on the issues that matter most. Coming to you from Austin, Texas, this is the Deciding Factor with your host, Alton Hill and John Herzog. All right, guys, so we're back. Bar. Tell us about Mr. Terry Tucker himself. I'm very excited to introduce Terry Tucker today. Uh, he has been a lot of things. He's been an NCAA Division uh, Division One college basketball player, a Citadel cadet, a marketing executive, a hospital administrator, an undercover narcotics investigator, a SWAT team hostage negotiator, a high school basketball coach, a business owner, a motivational speaker, an author, and for the past nine years, a cancer warrior. There's so many good stories here. This is hard to finish. Okay. He and his wife have lived all over the United States. They currently reside in Colorado with their daughter and Wheaton Terrier Maggie. Uh, Terry, is it okay to comment that you, you named the dog and not the daughter in this bio? <laughs> right. uh, in 2019, Terry started the website Motivational Check to help others find and lead their uncommon and extraordinary lives. Uh, he believes everyone is born to lead an uncommon and extraordinary life and has nothing to do with where you work, how much money you make, or where you live. Uh, 
This is discussed in his book, which I weirdly don't have the title of. I'm so sorry, Terry. Could you tell me the title of your book? Sustainable Excellence, The Ten Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. Thank you. Now pretend that I said that. Thank you, Terry, very much for coming on the show today. Oh, thank you, Barb, for having me on. And Alton and John, thank you for having me on. Yeah, sorry our intern dropped the ball there. But actually, it was me. So it was a copy paste. It was a copy paste catastrophe. Is <laughs> Listen, Troy, I kind of figure, you know, one of these days I'm going to figure out what I'm supposed to do when I grow up, you know. So it's, you know. <laughs> why bother? You just keep making a really long resume so that interns have to stumble over it. I think that seems more fun. <laughs> Quite a resume. Yeah. Hey, if we if we were doing it where I was doing the intro still, then we'd be doing four takes of it <laughs> and then eventually getting to the show. So. At least Barb still made it through. Welcome, and y'all, we need to congratulate Terry because he's made it through an extra and he's still here, so we're grateful. Yes. Hey, I enjoy having some fun. <laughs> you know, when you talk about cancer, it tends to be serious sometimes, so I enjoy the fun part oh, of yeah. it. yeah. <laughs> so, Terry, tell us something that's not in your bio that every listener should know. Or maybe not know. I can go with that one, too. I played against Michael Jordan in college. So did you dunk on him? Or what? <laughs> who? Won? Well, Terry lost a foot, so I think we know mm. who won there. Mm. You know, they did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but hey, we were winning at halftime. If that counts, you know, half the game we were winning. So I think know. it does. I think it counts. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> that's right. It's always in the box score and that you know and stuff like that. So yeah, so I played against Michael Jordan in college, and uh, my brother coached his sons when uh, he was in high school. Wow. Or when they were in high school. Man. Nice. That is crazy. So today's topic, we've chosen to go over, uh, do you control your own pain and suffering? So let's kind of define what, what you really are thinking here and what exactly you think suffering truly is. I guess I can tell you what happened with my cancer journey. And I, if somebody says that's not suffering, I don't know what it sure. is. Yeah. We'll let so, you know at the end. Cause yeah. you know, maybe. So like, 2000, it? 2012, <laughs> I'm a basketball coach, high school basketball coach, like Barb mentioned, and I have a callus break open on the bottom of my foot. Don't think much of it because I'm on my feet a lot. Doesn't heal after a couple of weeks. I go see a podiatrist friend of mine. He cuts out a cyst. Says he's seen thousands of these, no big deal, but I'll send it off to pathology anyway. <clears throat> Two weeks later, he calls me, and as I said, he was a friend of mine. And the more difficulty he was having telling me what was going on, the more frightened I became until he just laid it out. And he said, Terry, I've been a doctor for 25 years, and I have never seen this form of cancer that you have. I have a very rare form of melanoma that appears on the bottom of the feet or the palms of the hands. There's even a rare form that appears in your mucous membranes. So your nose, your mouth, and if you want to be really gross, your anus as well. So, but it's all a form of melanoma. I had to throw that in. You got to joke about this sometimes. <clears throat> yeah. So I was uh, sent to MD Anderson to have uh, surgery. I had the bottom of my foot removed and all the lymph nodes in my groin. And after I was healed, I was put on a weekly injection of a drug called interferon. I took a weekly injection of this drug for almost five years, and it gave me flu-like symptoms for two to three days every mm. week after each injection. So imagine having the flu every week for five years. And that was just to keep the disease from coming back. That wasn't a cure by any means whatsoever. Eventually, the drug became so toxic in my body that I ended up in the intensive care unit with a fever of 108 degrees, which usually is not compatible with being alive. but. I was at a great hospital and they were able to stabilize me and save my life. That was 2017, 2018, I had my left foot amputated uh, because the disease had come back. 2019, it came back again in my shin, had two surgeries. And then last year, an undiagnosed tumor grew large enough in my ankle to fracture my tibia, my shin bone. Oh, wow. And further testing found out I had, my entire lower leg was full of cancer and I ended up having my leg amputated above the knee right in the middle of a global pandemic. Wife dropped me off at the hospital. I was the only surgery that day. 
Um, you know, I remember my wife dropping me off. We've been married for 27 years. What should I do? Go to the parking lot and pray. That's about the only thing you can do right now. And I also found out I had tumors in my lungs and I'm currently undergoing treatment for those tumors right now. So I would say that pretty much qualifies as suffering. Does he, does he score? Well, I'm going to think about it. I mean, what I'm hearing is that you got to have surgery all by yourself in a hospital. You must have gotten all the jello. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm that's just saying, like, really good. suffering. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, okay, so that sucks. All right, so so talk about when during all of this did you write your book? So I had leg amputated in April. I started chemotherapy for the tumors in my lungs in June. And during that three-month period that I was supposed to be healing, I decided not to watch flat Netflix and uh, write a book. Wow. Really missed out, you know, because around that time, well, no, it doesn't matter. You can catch up later. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know how, how I would handle that, especially being stuck in the hospital without my spouse or any family coming to see me. I mean, y'all know me. <laughs> if I get a lump in my neck or something, I'm like, I'm freaking out. Yeah, no, nothing compared to what Terry's going through. So, Terry. <laughs> I'm going to remind you like, of that later. <clears throat> tell us specifically for you, like, what was the most the most grueling part or, like, that you felt required the most effort to overcome through all of that? Because that's, <laughs> that's a long list of things to, to deal with. I think the hardest part was the interferon, the five years of being on interferon. I, I, I remember when my oncologist suggested that, I kind of looked at her like, what? You, you want me to have the flu every week for five years? I, I just was like, that's just not humanly possible. That's just not something that, that a human being should be put through. And I, I, I was, and, and, and I did. And I, and, and I don't mean to sit here and say, I've got a big ass on my chest and I wear a cape. I don't, you know, I mean, there were days where, you know, I, I talk about winning, winning the day. Sometimes winning the day during that time was winning this five minutes. I, I, I just, I just got to get out of bed. I, I mean, I was so sick and felt so horrible. I, I mean, it, it was not just, I had the flu. I had like the worst case of the flu that I ever had. And, you know, that would, I took the injection on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. That's the, I, I just felt horrible. Wednesday you started to feel better, Thursday a little bit, but then Friday and Saturday, it was almost like my body knew, yeah, it's coming again. You would think that Friday and Saturday would be the two best days. They were, it was just like your body was like preparing itself for this inject, here we go, we're gonna do this again, aren't we? And that, and it, it just, it just sucked. I don't know, I don't know how else to, to describe it. And, and it, like I said, and then as soon as it stopped, the cancer came back. So it really, you sort of like, really, was it worth it? Man, I don't know. So for this, oh, sorry, John. I was just, I was curious before this, I mean, you've had f more, uh, I guess I'd say medical tragedy crammed into five years than a lot of people get in a lifetime. Would you say, was this new for you to experience this kind of pain and suffering? Is this something that you, uh, I'm, I guess I'm wondering about the learning curve. You get this diagnosis, you get these horrible treatments. What was that like for you? So I, I, when I was in high school, I had three knee surgeries and, and two of them were pre-arthroscopic. So I have the long zipper scar. I spent an entire summer one month in a cast from my hip to my ankle because of knee surgery. They don't, they don't do that stuff anymore. But it was, it was kind of back then that I, I sort of realized I, I have these four truths that I kind of live my life by. And the first one is you need to control your mind or it will control you. And, and I remember sort of my brain or my thoughts were like, uh, you know what, yeah, this, these knee surgeries, you're a step slower or coaches aren't gonna wanna recruit you and stuff like that. And I quickly learned, you had to, you had to change the narrative. You gotta flip that around to something that, that's positive. And, and that's kind of what I tried to do. I, I mean, I, I joke about this a lot. I, I mean, when I was on interferon, I lost 50 pounds. There was a point where I thought I was so skinny that I could go hang gliding on a Dorito. I mean, <laughs> It's a joke, but it, it but it's true. You know, you've got to find a way to deal with this garbage, with this crap, and all that kind of stuff. And I've always said that we're all going to experience pain in our lives, and 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 it doesn't have to be 
pain like me with cancer. I mean, you could flunk a test at school or break up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or, or you know, have an, an auto accident on the way to work. Everybody's going to experience pain. Pain is inevitable. Suffering, on the other hand, that's optional. That's what you do with that pain. Do you use that pain? Do you wallow in it? Do you sit down there in the gunk? Or do you take that pain, flip it inside, use it as energy, use it as fuel to make you a stronger and more determined individual? And I've done the latter. And again, I don't sit here and say that I've got a big S on my chest or you know that I wear a cape. I don't. I cry. I get down. I get depressed. I have bad days. I just choose not to stay there very long. So you were you were a police officer for 10 years. And I'd imagine you had a lot of suffering in a different aspect with that job. Am I correct? Correct. So is, is it when you were a police officer that you really learned the true keys to overcoming suffering or was it before that? I think it was it was some before that. It was some during my law enforcement days. I remember my uh, the the defensive tactics instructor that we had at the Cincinnati Police Academy used to have us bring a photograph of the people that we loved the most to class, and we would look at that photograph when we were learning how to defend ourselves, you know, during defensive tactics, because he reasoned that you will fight harder for the people you love than you will fight for yourself. And he wanted you to realize that at three o'clock in the morning, when some drunk guy pulls a knife on you, that there's a husband or a wife or kids or mom and dad or somebody on the other end of that that wants you to come home. That this just isn't about you. And I think part of that is, and, and why I think you, you know, to have a good life, you can't have the attitude of what's in it for me. You've got to have the attitude of, you've got to be part of something bigger than yourself. I mean, this clinical trial that I'm on right now, it's probably not going to save my life, but it may give the doctors some kind of information that they can develop a drug that maybe 10 years from now, it can save somebody else's life. So yes, I hope it saves my life. I pray for that miracle every day, but if it doesn't, I'll realize that my life was a little bit bigger than just me. Wait, so are you saying you have in a ways received a death sentence that they're taking a random shot at curing you? It, it, it's not so much curing. It's more, we're going to do this and see if we can buy you some more time. I, I, I'm, I'm more than likely going to die. I know I don't sit here and look like somebody who's probably going to die, but yeah, I, I mean, I have these tumors in my lungs. The drug has shrunk them by about 30%, but that still leaves tumors that are fairly good size in my lungs. And like I say, they're not talking cure. They're talking, can we buy you some more time? And I'm okay with that. I mean, people always want to, you know, yes, I'm probably dying. And that's okay. Because I've lived the life that I was put here to do. And it's okay to move on. I'm almost excited to see what's kind of on the other side of this life. You know, I think that, and, and I'm not in your shoes, Terry, at all. But, um, you know, during this whole COVID crisis, pandemic uh I, I feel like we've watched a lot of people panic with the idea of their own mortality and if people listen to the podcast they know i like to ride a motorcycle really fast and you know i think <laughs> so i've kind of come to grips with my own <laughs> i'm doing things that are not like inside my body i'm doing it to myself that could kill me um, but people forget that we are all dying. And I think that the sooner we come to grips with that, maybe the sooner we'll do awesome things, you know, and maybe decide to write a book or, you know, do start doing more things for other people because we actually recognize that our, our time is limited. So you, you talked a little bit about it, but would you mind elaborating a little bit more about maybe what's inspiring you to have such a positive attitude and when you know like what's that picture for you is it that is it a picture of the person you love or what's uh what's going through your mind that's uh keeping you strong yeah you know mark twain had a great quote he said you know the two most important days of our lives are the day we're born and the day we figure out why and and i have i have found my why I, but i also have 
you know, I always talk about what has gotten me through a lot of times in life and, and certainly through cancer as well, or what I like to call the three F's, faith, family, and friends. I have a very deep faith in God. I have an unbelievably great family. I, I have a, a wife who, you know, for 27 years has stayed by me. When she married me, I was a, a suit and tie, eight to five, Monday through Friday, hospital administrator. And two years later, I'm like, Hey, hon, I'd kind of like to go be a policeman. What do you think about that? You know, and was very supportive of me. And when she lost her job in Cincinnati, she's the primary breadwinner. We had to move to Texas and I was supportive of her to to move on with that. I mean, we have a daughter who's a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and is a lieutenant in the newly formed branch of the military, the Space Force. So, I mean, I've got a great family. I've got a couple of brothers. My mother's still alive and things like that. And, and I've got friends and and those things have sustained me through law enforcement. I mean, I saw a lot of hopelessness and helplessness as a cop. And I know people who went out and medicated themselves, took drugs, you know, uh, took alcohol. I know people who I've worked with who have killed themselves because of that. And, you know, that's that's a horrible thing. But my sanctuary was my family. No, I'm not going out to the bars with you guys. I'm going home. I'm going to be with my family. And that's kind of what's gotten me through, in addition to, as I mentioned, the four truths. And I, I could give you those real quick if, if you, yeah, if you want. And they're so the first one is, and I, and I told you, you need to control your mind or it will control you. The second one is you need to embrace the pain and the suffering that we all experience in life and use it to make you a stronger and more determined individual. And the third one, and this one I've kind of added recently because I think it's important for everybody to kind of look at the end game. Yes, I'm coming to the end of my life, but I think it's important for everybody to kind of look at that. And, and the, the truth is this, what you leave behind is what you weave in the hearts of other people. And then the fourth one is pretty self-explanatory. As long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. And I use those to make decisions. I mean, I had a nurse come to me recently and say, you know, Terry, this, this clinical trial is kicking your butt. Nobody would think anything less of you if you stopped it, if you got off it, if you quit. And I tried to explain these truths to her and I could tell it didn't resonate at all. But I told her, I said, you know, my doctor may take me off this study or I may die on this study, but I'll never quit this study because I'm just not wired that way. I'm, I'm not wired that way to quit. I mean, we're my pain is going to end someday. It may end through surgery. It may end through medication, man, because I die. But if I quit, if I give up, if I give in, pain will always be with me. It will always be part of my life. And I don't want it to be part of my life. I, I want to use it to make me strong. So is it those steps that you're talking about? Like, let's, let's say I got the bad news tomorrow and I come to you and I'm like, Terry, I don't know how you do it. I need help. I, I feel like it's just my time and I, I just need to give it up. Is that what you tell me? Or do you have other things that kind of walk me through what I need to do? I mean, I, I don't, I don't believe in giving it up. I mean, I'll go down fighting, and and, and don't get me wrong. I, I, you know, I plan my funeral. I've been to the mortuary, the cemetery, everything. I, everything's done, and people are like, "Well, that's kind of a defeatist attitude, isn't it?" I kind of look at them like, "Well, last time I checked, we're all going to die. I don't think anybody's working on a cure for life right now." Yeah. So, you know, they tried. There's a vaccine yeah, now. Exactly. Yeah, a so I would, you know, everybody dies, but not everybody really lives. Amen. And I would say. Find that purpose. Find the reason that you were put on the face of this earth and live it. Because if you do that, you will not be nearly as afraid of dying. And, and I've seen a lot of people die as a cop and certainly with the number of years I've, I've had cancer. And what I've observed, and, and again, this is going to be very generic, the people who kind of go peacefully are the people that did something with their lives. They got out there and they lived their life. And the people who, you know, I want another day or another month or I want another year go kicking and screaming, those see, always seem to be the people that never did anything. You know, they're, they, they get up, they go to work, they come home, they watch TV, they go to bed. I mean, they do the same thing. If you're not growing, then you're dying. And, you know, if you've got something, especially, I always tell this to young people, if there's something in your heart, if you have a passion to do something and it scares you, go ahead and do it. Because at the end of your life, the things you're going to regret are not going to be the things you did. 
They're going to be the things that you didn't do. And by then it's going to be too late to do them. So can I ask a really practical question here? Uh -oh, just here a, we go. Uh, about physical pain. No, no, no. I, <laughs> okay, I'm just, Terry, I'm going to admit. I read, uh, it, was, it was something from an email. John let me hack his email today so that I could read everything. <laughs> On paper, you don't sound like this. So, um, first of all, I want to rewrite your bio so that it comes across as great as you do. Um, but uh, my question is more, you're talking, there's obviously emotional pain here in, in facing your own mortality. But I'm curious about the physical pain side. I'm curious about, uh, can, can you give us a practical example of what this controlling your mind looks like when you wake up at 3 a.m. and you're writhing? I mean, I assume there's a lot of pain associated with your treatment and I mean, various, none of this sounds not painful, quite frankly, but I'm, I'm curious, physical pain sometimes throws a lot of our idealism out the window for a lot of people. And physical pain is something, uh, when you're on a clinical trial, it's all about data. It's all about, you know, what's your blood pressure, how much of this drug is still left in your system after you know, 30 minutes, an hour, eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. And, and, and there have been days, and, and I, I, some people may find this painful. It's certainly not uh, unpainful, if that's a word. I think it just made up a word. Um, you heard it first here. But there were days where, <laughs> say that again, I, said, I didn't hear And it. you heard it first here. <laughs> there you go. That's right, right next to the catheter store. So uh, there were days where I would go for a clinical trial that they would stick me with the needle 18, 19, 20 times. And it was, you know, it was always a different needle. It was, it was, you know, we got to take your blood and we can't take it from this arm. We got to take it from that arm and we can't do this. And we can, it, it's so ridiculous. Some of the things that, but, but that's the data that they want. So, you know, you get to a point where God, that hurts, you know, and, and yes, you are, but it's all about taking that physical pain and flipping it inside. And instead of running from it, saying, all right, do it again. Do it again. Do it no, again. I'm out. And do it as many times as you want, because I will take that, and I will take that pain, and I will use it to make me stronger. I will use that to make me tougher. You can do that. I am not special at this. I mean, literally, when I was a little kid and I knew my mom was taking me to the doctor for a vaccination, I'd wait till she got out of the car and I'd lock all the doors from the inside. And that was before key fog. That's how frightened I was of getting one shot. And she'd have to go in and get the pediatrician. And it was a cat and mouse game to get me out of the car. And, you know, pediatrician put me over his shoulder and, you know, take me in, give me an injection. That's how frightened I was of it. So you can learn to flip that narrative. You can learn to flip that switch and say, just give it to me now. I'll take it. Instead of running from it, I'll take it and it'll make me stronger. I'm just imagining all the nurses like, he really wants me to stab him. What's going on here? He's asking for it yeah. again and again. Yeah. You well, know it's they funny they it. always do that. And then they're like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm like, don't be sorry. <laughs> yeah. I signed up for this. You know, I, I knew this was going to be part of it. So don't, don't apologize because you got to stick me again. See, I, it always helped me oddly. My, my kids have been in the hospital a lot and I've got my own medical stuff. But uh, I, it always helped me to assume that just one of those nurses was really enjoying it. It felt good to me to be like, you know what? I think this one... <laughs> I think this one did actually mean to do that. Ow! You know, like, <laughs> I told the you not to do that, man. Right? A little bit. Like, they're, they're the ones that always get assigned to night, you know, to the night shift, right? And they come yeah, in and they flip on the lights at, yeah. exactly, at 1 o'clock in the morning. Like, give me your arm. Anyway, sorry. That's personal. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's just the way it is. And and, and, it, and it sucks. And, and don't, don't get me, I mean, don't sit here and think that I enjoy it. I don't. But I've just decided I'm not going to run from it. I'm not going to be a baby about it. I'm just going to take it because it, it's amazing what you can handle. There's a there's a Navy SEAL out there that maybe you've heard of by the name of David Goggins. He talks about the 40 percent rule that if you you know, if you're at the end, you don't think you can go any further. You don't you, you know, you know, I cannot do another push up. I can do another sit up. I was in the emergency room and literally looked at my wife and I'm like, I'm done. Let me die. Please let me die. Tears coming down my eyes. And I remembered the Goggins 40% rule that if you think it, you're at the end of your life, the end of your rope, whatever it is, you're only at 40% and you still have 60% left in your reserves to do that. And I, and I just thought, you know what, I'm going inside. I'm going to figure this out. And I think he was right. I think we get to a point where I don't think I can do any more. Oh, you can do so much more so much more than you think now, you can. Terry, I'm going to hate you for that statement because you know Alton's going to use that against me 
in some future <laughs> incident. See, I've, yeah. I've read the book, Terry, so I'm very familiar with you Goggins. Goggins' book. Yeah, so have I. But John yeah. doesn't know. He's like, oh, man, another book Alton's going to send me. <laughs> no, I mean, it's super inspiring, right? And, and, I, and I'm glad that we're able to do this podcast because I think, you know, right now for you, Terry, it's cancer. And, you know, Barbara hinted to some of the things that, that she's going through. But each one of us has something that, that we're struggling with, that we're trying to get through whether it's physical pain, whether it's emotional, or just like the idea that we want to grow and we just, boom, hit that wall. And so I think, you know, I'm glad that you reminded everyone that you do have so much more that you can tap into, but you have to have that mindset, right, of belief that you can, because if you're not believing that. Yeah, it's easy to quit. It's easy to give up. It's easy to say, I don't want to do this anymore. It's tough to keep moving forward, you know, regardless of whether, you know, you're, you're trying to get a PhD or, you know, you get through whatever it is, it doesn't have to be, you know, cancer, like we're mm -hmm. talking about. It can be so many things in your life. You're always going to butt up against an obstacle and so many people just quit. They just give up. You know, it's the old Jerry Rice quote of, you know, today I will do what others won't so that tomorrow I can do what others mm -hmm. can't. You know, and, and I, I love that saying. I, it's just, you know what, I'm going to do this today because I know you're not going to do it. And all, you know this, Doc Goggins talks about it in his book about taking souls, about taking, you know, people's soul. And I will literally wheel my wheelchair into, into the therapy on Monday and I'll look at one of the nurses and I'm like, we're going to take some souls yeah, today. Totally, Let's go. Totally. So are you fully in a wheelchair now 100% of the time? I am in a wheelchair. I, I have a, and I'm glad you're all sitting down. I have a $49,000 prosthetic yes. leg that I wish would allow me to jump over the house like the $6 million man used to do. None probably of you remember of that because you're not old then. You, yeah. you probably need to, I mean, you keep saying you don't have a cape, but have you thought about just getting a cape? Because I thought about like it. Yeah, I don't look good in, you know, tights. I don't look oh, good in tights. So, oh. you know, I only have one leg. So, you know, wouldn't look good in tights. They finally yes, fit right. I, I have a prosthetic. <laughs> I just haven't been able to physically, I only get so many physical therapy appointments and I just haven't been able to physically get with the with the therapist, although our daughter's getting married in October. So now I have even more motivation to be able to walk her down the aisle. And yeah. I wouldn't bet against me. I feel like me. we need to get her a TDFK. <laughs> Let's look at that, Barb. Let's get him a TDF cape. Yeah. I and think then he, he has to wear it around every time he goes to the hospital. I'll do that. Hey, okay. I enjoy having a good time. <laughs> You know that none of us are crafty here. So, listeners, if any of you are crafty, feel free to uh, make oh, a cape. No, no, we'll no. Get Alton's Terry's good with Photoshop. Him and his wife, man. Oh, yeah. I can Photoshop something. That's true. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but he needs a real cape. He needs like a, you know, like. Yeah. Never mind. I digress. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. So, I, I see what you're saying with everything. So, let me throw a curveball at you, right? Like, right now. I feel like I would have some motivation, right? I've got kids. I don't want to leave them hanging. My wife will probably shove me out the door faster so she can get the life insurance policy. But, you know, um, but, but when it comes down to it, let's say they don't exist. How am I going to find motivation when, let's say, I have no family, no friends? What do you do? You have to decide you want what you want. I, I mean, what, whatever it is, you have to decide you want to live. I mean, when I was a hostage negotiator with the police department, 90% of the time we were successful, 10% we weren't. And, and not being successful meant people killed themselves. So that was their decision. So you've got to decide you want to live. You've got to decide that there's some value to your life. And if you don't think there's value, I, I don't know how to how you're going to answer that question. You've got to have something in your life to live for. And for me, it's faith, family and friends. Maybe it's your faith. I, I don't know what you I, I don't want to put my faith on you. I don't know what you believe, but there's got to be something in life that's bigger than you, because if it's not, if it's all about you, that's going to be hard to motivate yourself to do that. So then we've got a uh, as friends of people around us or uh, brothers or sisters in Christ, right? Are you saying we should all 
be looking out for those who might be going through it and really help them find that motivation? I think Alton hit, kind of hit the nail on the head. Everybody's going through something. You know, it, it, it may be big. It may be small. It may be, you know, hey, my mom's 85 years old and she's got dementia. And I don't know what to do. It may be I think I'm going to lose my job. It may be there's a lump here and I don't know what that is. I, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't have to be physical. It can be emotional. It can be psychological. We're all going through something. But, yeah, I think we need to start taking care of each other. You know, this attitude of, you know, it's all about what's in it for me. If there's nothing in it for me, then I'm not going to do it. Th that attitude would have, we would have been speaking German if that would have been the attitude during World War II. <laughs> I, I, I mean, quite frankly. I mean, you look at the, it's funny because people have asked me, what do you think about the night before you're going to have your foot amputated or the night before you're going to have, you know, your leg amputated? And in all honesty, what I thought about was those men and women on those boats sitting off the coast of Normandy that were going to get on those Higgins boats in the morning and go ashore. And so many of them were going to get massacred. And they were 16 and 17 and 18 and 19 and 20 year old kids who never got to live their life. But they, they, they were part of something that was bigger than them. They wanted to make a difference in this world. And I mean, getting mowed down in a Higgins boat before you even got out, did they make a difference? I don't know. There's, there's, thousands of crosses in those cemeteries over in Europe that every time I see them, I get emotional. I mean, those people gave their life so you and I could sit here and do that stuff. So Terry, I want to ask something that I think you've kind of talked about a little, but this is something um, that I've been thinking about a lot and maybe some other people can <laughs> relate or maybe not. But I think sometimes when things happen to us, especially if we have you know, pain or, or whatever. I didn't get the job promotion. It doesn't even have to be, you know, earth shattering, but we can kind of get <clears throat> this victim mentality about, well, why is this happening to me? You know, why did I get cancer or, you know, whatever that is. Um, I mean, I know you've given us some rules, but how have you avoided that? And I'm imagining the Normandy thing, you know, like, why did I get chosen to sit in this boat? Like, how do we avoid that type of a mindset? I think you've got to find some meaning in your pain. You know, there's got to be some some meaning to you that um, I, I'm reminded of kind of the story. Uh, I've always been a big fan of Westerns. So I'm going to tell another story now, Bart. <laughs> Uh, I've always been a big fan of Westerns and, you know, my parents used to let me stay up when I was little and watch Gunsmoke and Wild Wild West and all that kind of stuff. 1993, the movie Tombstone comes out and most of you have probably seen it. It starred Val Kilmer as a guy by the name of John Doc Holliday <laughs> and Kurt Russell as a guy by the name of Wyatt Earp. Now, Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp were two living, breathing human beings that walked on the face of the earth. They're not uh, characters just made up for the movie. And at the very end of the movie, Doc Holliday is dying in a sanitarium in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, about three hours from my house. And they called him Doc because he was a dentist by trade, but in all honesty, he was pretty much a card shark and a gunslinger. And Wyatt had been a lawman his entire life. So these two men from entirely different backgrounds, they come together and form this great friendship. So at the end of this movie, Doc's dying and they're talking about what they want out of life. And Doc says, I was in love with my cousin when I was young, but she joined a convent over the affair, but she's all I ever wanted. And he looks at Wyatt and he says, what about you, Wyatt? What do you want? And Wyatt says, I just want to lead a normal life. And Doc looks at him and says, there's no normal, there's just life and get on with living yours. So, you know, it, we're all kind of waiting for that thing. You know, if this happens, I'll have a normal life. If this happens, I'll be rich. If this happens, I'll be famous. What I'd say to you is, is don't wait for that stuff to happen because it's certainly it's not guaranteed that's going to happen. And just because you get that doesn't mean your life is going to be any better. This is the life you've got. These are the cards that I've been dealt and I have to play them and I have to play them to the best of my ability. And if I die going down doing that, I'm good with that. But I just can't see quitting or giving up on this life that I've been given. You know, I got Boom. <laughs> I got so distracted because you were like, I like old westerns, and then you started talking about the Wild Wild West, and I'm thinking, no, that was a '90s show with Will Smith. Why? Why is he talking about that? It was. Oh it was a remake. 
<laughs> Tombstone, I think, is one of one of the best. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's a great, <laughs> great way to to wrap up the the show. Because I mean, that's such a great relationship, and they're really like constantly dealing with a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> in that in that movie, but they handled them well. I don't know if gentleman is the word, but with some amount of grace <laughs> that um, doesn't focus on the pain, right? Doesn't focus on the. I mean, Doc Holliday, right? He's got tuberculosis. The, tuberculosis. Yeah, he's dying of tuberculosis, time. which is why I moved to Cal Colorado. Yeah, he's from Georgia originally. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, so Terry, I'm going to give you let's say 90 seconds to convince us with your last push as to how we actually control our own suffering. I'm just going to lay my life out in front of you. I'm going to lay the last nine years out in front of you and say, that's how you control your suffering that you can do absolutely more than you ever thought you could do in your life. And, and, and that's suffering that, again, doesn't have to be cancer. I know we've talked a lot about my cancer journey, but it doesn't have to be cancer. It can be anything in your life that you're struggling with and you don't think you can do it. I don't think I can possibly get through this. I'm telling you, you can. You can do so much more. I am living proof that you can do so much more than you ever thought you could do with your life. Wow. One last thing for you. I've never offered to do this for anybody on our show. If I say a prayer for you tonight, what do you want me to ask? And what do you want me to pray for? Don't pray for me. And, 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 and I don't mean this. I, prayer means a lot to me. But I, and, and I probably spend an hour every day in prayer. And I, I, I'm not going to tell you I don't pray for myself. I do. I pray for a miracle to get these tumors out of my lungs. But I pray for so many other people that I've met. So when you pray... Pray for all the people that are around the world that are in pain right now. Ask God to take them out of that pain. Wow. All right, Terry. See, that went a totally different direction than I thought it was going to go. I honestly thought John was going to lead this back to the catheter, and I was like, no, come on. It's been a good show. Don't end it there. Instead, you took it. All right. Terry, yep. thank you. So <laughs> <I may have>. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for being on the show uh, we are going to follow this up with our deciding factor, but before you leave us, tell us how the listeners can be in touch with you, follow you on social media, and where or how to get your book. So my book is available um, on Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, Apple iBooks, anywhere you can get a book online, you can get Sustainable Excellence. If you want to follow me, my site is motivationalcheck.com. Uh, you can leave me a message there. It has my social media uh, links. It has a link to the book as well. Every day I post a, a, th a thought for the day, a motivational thought for the day. On Monday, I, I post the Monday morning motivational message, which you can't say when you're drunk. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I just post different stories and things. I know, I know people are busy, so they're quick, they're short. Get in, get a quick sh shot of motivation, and get on with your day. So motivationalcheck.com. Wow. Well, we'll also post the links down below. Uh, once again, thank you so much, Terry. And stay in touch with us. We'd like to know what's going on. And we'll still hope for some great news somehow. Yeah. Absolutely. Fighting, I, I hope every day. Absolutely. Thank you all for having me on. I appreciate all it very right. much. You, you have a good night. Pleasure to meet you. Bye -bye. Take care. All right, guys. I'm just going to say it. We should probably jump right into it. So unless you've got something you want to say that pertains to everything he threw at us. Yeah, it was a lot. I'll say that. I'm processing. I just want to rewrite his bio. That was a totally misleading bio. I came in prepared. That book I would buy. Could we fix our, our nope. bet? I'll buy his book and I'll read it. <laughs> it's and then too late. You already bought it. That it's in your house. Like. It's time to read, girl. I just have to find yours now. At I'm this saying, point. So John. Sorry. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry. Barbara that. reads, John. <laughs> there is something crazy going on at Alton's house, though. So I wonder what's going on behind the scenes. All right, let's do this, guys. 
the deciding factor. Now it's time for our deciding factor. Y'all didn't hear that music, did you? No. Oh, okay. Are we off beat? Yeah, totally. <laughs> no. There's new features in our recording software. So I'm jamming out to the music and y'all didn't hear a thing. That was pretty cool. Way to not share. Yeah, yeah, Sheesh. Yeah. Um, so, man. You know, man, I don't even know how to start this at this point. Start uh, it and say what the deciding factor is. Yeah, there you go. So, do you control your own pain and suffering? Pain, no. Suffering, I think you can amplify it. I don't know that you can really remove the suffering as well as he describes. Because, man, I, if I were in his position, that would be really tough. Nine years? Are you kidding me? I don't know. I maybe it's just my my personality, my mindset. I mean, I would want to stick around for my kids as long as possible, but there's only so much pain you can handle. So I'm torn on this one. I can't. I can't make a decision. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you want to make a decision. You're just not sure if you believe it. Yeah, I mean, what I'm hearing. Ooh. Deep. Yeah. I, I'm I'm leaning more towards yes you control it, but man, I don't know that I'm fully on board. It sounds like you think that you can control it, you're just not sure you want to. Because I mean if there's one thing I got from that, it's it's he described phenomenal exertion. It's not like, oh just don't think about it. Just be positive, which is why I want to rewrite his bio, because it sounds like it's going to be this message of just believe in yourself and think positively. I related to everything he said. So is it my turn? Oh, you're in your turn. Just turn? My... Okay, good. Yeah, awesome. Time's um, up. Nope. I'm now it, on. It's Alton's turn. we got to wait for his now... five minutes to be done. <laughs> I'm on 23 years of constant full body pain. Okay, everything that this man said, I thought, yeah, that's totally true. You cannot control how much pain you have, but you absolutely, and I think you have to, make decisions about what you're going to do with it. I don't think that I am as shiny of a person. I would totally wear a cape. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's, I just don't even understand why he's not wearing a cape. But, um, you know, maybe I, <laughs> I might cope in different ways, uh, but I relate to what he's saying and that uh, there does come a time when you're going to have to decide. And I, I think because my pain started so young, nobody told me that there was an option of just becoming a drugged out addict and not ever living. And so I kind of did the functional thing for a decade before I realized that people do that. <laughs> like people just stop living. And by then I'm in a habit. So, um, no, I, I agreed with him. Uh, I think that he had a good perspective. I think I appreciated that he also included that controlling your response to pain doesn't mean that you're not going to scream about it. Screaming about it is part of it too. Now I was, I was watching Alton take notes, so I know he's got something good for us. <laughs> well, uh, don't, don't set me up to fail. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think I'm definitely on the same, same page with you guys. Uh, I definitely liked his message and I like what you said, John, about, um, I don't know if I've really, uh, you know, thought about separating the pain from the suffering. And I think that that's really the message that I heard from him was like, Hey, look, we're all going to be in pain, pick it or don't, but like you get to decide and you should decide how you're going to deal with it and whether you're going to use that for fuel for something better, like either demonstrating how strong you can be for your family or just being strong for people who might end up with the same crap that you have later, but finding that reason to use the pain as fuel for something better instead of the pain as just fuel to make yourself miserable. And the reality is like, we're the only ones who can make that choice, right? Like y'all can't make that choice for me. Um, and so I thought that was, um, 
like super crucial that that he said and i like that he said uh i mean i struggle with that victim mindset thing just because i don't know whatever but i do and so i thought it was good that he's like look this is the life that you have <laughs> like so pretending that it's not yours or looking on instagram and thinking you want someone else's is kind of foolish like you got to deal with what you've been given and i guess my final thought that he didn't seem to touch on much but certainly i felt is like the role that fear plays in all of this and fear is really your mind right it's it's what you think is going to happen or the story that you put with some event i didn't get this promotion so i'm not going to make a lot of money so my wife's going to leave me my kids will think i'm a loser or whatever right like we just can go down this rabbit hole of of fear or there's a pandemic i might get COVID. if i get COVID, uh, i might die and if i die then what then like we can just do all that and i think that in that aspect we are certainly creating our own suffering and so i think what terry was talking about is the opposite of that it's like look just embrace it and use it as fuel and don't don't freak out and panic and all of those things happen in your mind so i'm i'm all in all in that we can control it and um but I think we have to work at it, you know, like what you were talking about, Barbara. It's not just necessarily something you just turn on, you know, but we can definitely develop it and, and um, you know, recognize our potential and how much we're really capable of. Mm. What a great guy. What, what a bunch of good stories that we heard from him in this show and our extra. So... Let me just remind you all, if you liked Terry on this show, go check out the extra that he was in with us because it was funny. I can say that at least. Um, but most importantly, let's add this to the end. This show was about your own pain and suffering. But keep in mind, like we said on the show, there's a lot of people around you that have their own pain and suffering. Check in on them. Maybe they're at church. Maybe they're at work. Maybe they're in your own family. Check in. See if you can give them that extra motivation and that push. But guys, thank you for staying tuned. Make sure you check us out on all of our other shows. Follow us on social media, especially YouTube. We've got a lot of videos up there. Go check them out. Make sure you also check out. <laughs> Make sure you also check out our regular website. There's a lot of stuff on there. Barb's going to write some more blogs for us. And What's our website? Oh, yeah. It's the Deciding Factor Podcast.com. Guys, stay tuned. We'll see you next time on The Deciding Factor. Everyone, say bye. Peace. Bye. <laughs> this has been another episode of The Deciding Factor giving you food for thought on real life issues. Be sure to click like and subscribe to this podcast as well as all your big social media outlets, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Don't forget to check out our website at the deciding factor podcast.com and give us comments and feedback until next time. Stay safe and remember to keep an open mind.